In this video, we're going to look at introducing uh, the, the topic of uh, the derivative and what it means for a function to be locally linear. And to do that, we're going to work our way through an activity um, where we're looking at the average rate of change of a given function over an interval. So here in this first activity, what we're going to do is we're going to imagine that we have a ball that is being thrown vertically at 64 feet per second from an initial height of about 6 feet. And we can model the height of this equation by using the equation negative 16 t squared plus my initial velocity times t sine of theta plus h naught. Well, if I'm throwing the ball straight up in the air, that means that theta is 90. So I can rewrite this equation as negative 16 t squared plus 64 plus 6. So that's going to be the model we're going to use to model the height of this thrown ball. And we are going to be focusing on the average velocity for this uh, thrown object. Well, remember, from Algebra 1, you have a formula distance equals rate times time. And the rate is the velocity. Now, velocity is a vector, meaning it can be either positive or negative. And so if I wanted to find the average velocity equation on an interval that went from a to b for this function h of t, I would find the displacement of h over the interval. And then I would divide by the time interval itself, so b minus a. And so that's how we would determine the average velocity. And so let's look here at this first one. It wants us to find the average velocity of the thrown ball from t equals 1 to t equals 3. Well, to find the average velocity, I am going to determine h of 3, and I'm going to subtract h of 1 from it, and then divide that by the overall time span, 3 minus 1, to get my answer. And, I, and to speed this process up, I'm going to use a table here to help me out. And so what I'm, what I'm going to do is I'm going to type in h of 3, and I get 54. And h of 1 is also 54, divided by 2. And so my average velocity is 0. Now let's think about what that means in context of this uh, graph here, is that basically I'm looking at this ball that was thrown, and this models my height, and over the course of that span, the average velocity is nothing more than the slope formula between the two points that we have. So we have the, the first point here, 1, 54, and then the second one's at 3, uh, 54 roughly, and we are going to, we subtract that, we have a horizontal line in between those two points. And so that's why the average rate of change um, is going to be equal to zero, the average velocity. Okay, we'll do the same process again. We're going to find the average velocity from t equals 2 to t equals 3. So I'm going to find the value of the h function at 3 and subtract the value of the h function at 2 and divide that by the overall width of the interval. And we know h of 3 is 54. And h of 2 is 70. And 54 minus 70, um, negative 16. And so the average velocity in this case would be negative 8. And I could uh, attach units to this. Uh, if my height was in feet, this would be negative 8 feet per second. We start to wonder, well, what would happen and create the, in or what would the instantaneous velocity be at time is equal to 3? So we've found average velocity over these intervals, but I want to know what is the 
instantaneous rate of change? Well, we only have one number for t. And so if we used our same formula, we would say h of 3 minus h of 3 divided by 3 minus 3. And that's going to give us 0 over 0, which is an indeterminate form. And so that what would that instantaneous rate of change be? That meaning when time is equal to 3, how fast is the ball moving? Well, in order to accomplish this, we're going to have to investigate a little farther because our current formula requires us to be using two values for time to determine what the average velocity is. So what we're going to do is we're going to make these intervals smaller. So we're going to start off, we're going to say, okay, well, let's investigate and get very close to time is equal to 3. So we go h of 3 minus h of 2.5 over 3 minus 2.5 and then get that Now let's get a little closer to 3. So let's go from t equals 2.99 to 3. And let's do it another time where we get even closer, we make our interval even smaller. And so we want to go back now and we want to look at, well, what would we guess that the velocity of the ball would be at 3? So what we did is we started with an interval that was half a second long away from 3. And we got negative 24 feet per second. And then we started to close this interval up. So it was only 0.1, one-tenth of a second away from 3. And the velocity was negative 30.4. And then we got even closer to 3 by a hundredth, 2.99 to 3, estimated that velocity was negative 31.84, and then even closer one thousandth of a second away, and we got that velocity there to be negative 31.984 feet per second. And so if we needed to predict the velocity of the ball at t is equal to 3, what we're going to do is we're going to look and say, okay, well, what do we, what are this what are these numbers getting very close to? And I'm going to say they're working their way pretty close to about negative negative 32 feet per second. Now, in this process of what we did, we started to narrow in our, our focus from a window that was where the distance between the two points was a half a second away from one another. And we, as we started to make these points closer together, we started to narrow in on a singular one point to kind of work our way to make this prediction. The reason why we were able to do this was because the curve was considered locally linear, which means as you start to zoom in on the point of focus, the curve starts to look more and more like a line. And the way we predicted this uh, average velocity was we used the average rate of change, our old slope formula back from Algebra 1. Okay, so now we're going to continue forward in building towards this definition of 
a derivative and we're going to look at what it means to be locally linear so in our previous example with the thrown ball we mentioned uh we talked about a curve being locally linear with how we went through the process of finding the average velocity we basically narrowed in our focus around a point in question uh to where if we really zoomed in we were able to predict the average rate of change uh, or we were able to predict the rate of change at a singular one point by using the average rate of change formula. And that brings us to what it means for a curve to be locally linear. A curve is locally linear when you really zoom in to a function that starts to resemble a line. That's the most informal way to describe it being locally linear. Um, and the slope of this line as you zoom in is what we call the derivative or the instantaneous rate of change of a function. And so what we're going to do here is we're going to look at the, uh, this function here. Now, if I start really zoomed in, this function here, which I've, I've already spilled the beans a little bit because I told you it was the sine function and we know in our head what the sine function looks like but when I'm very zoomed in and I'm looking here at this point pi over two comma one I look at this graph and it looks to be like a horizontal line so at this point uh, pi over two comma one the sine function is locally linear now if I start zooming out as I start to zoom out from that point, you're gonna to start to see the curvature, the characteristics away from that point where it's locally linear at that we have highlighted. So I'm gonna to start to see the curve of the sine function if I zoom more and more away from that point. I can start to see the entire wave. The only way we could make the assumption that this curve is locally linear but was by increasing our zoom. Now what we're going to do is we're going to go the other direction. So I'm going to start with some equations that are given. And I got three different ones. And I want to know, at the point that's indicated, is the curve locally linear? And so it seemed pretty easy with the sine function at that point. And say, okay, well, if I zoom in far enough, uh, it should make, make a line. And... I want to look at these kind of one at a time. So if I look at this first function, 1 plus the absolute value of x, and I'm looking at the point 0, 1. Initially, when I look at it, this doesn't look very good because it doesn't look like a line there. It has a very sharp change, and I'm looking for something to make a, uh, a straight line. And as I continue to zoom in on that point and closer and closer and closer, it's never looking like a straight line that passes through that point. And so our... Um, conclusion here is going to be not locally linear. At that point, at x is equal to zero. Now we got a new equation. So one plus the square root x squared plus point zero zero one. I'm looking at the point uh, zero comma one point zero three two, and determine if this function is locally linear or not. Well, initially, if I'm looking at that picture, I look and it looks just like the previous problem with the absolute value where my initial assumption was no uh, for that point. But let's continue our investigation. Let's zoom in and see what's actually happening here. And as I start to zoom in, oh, my point's a little bit off. But as I start to zoom in at this point, it is really really starting to look like a line that passes all the way through there. So at that point, we're going to say it is locally linear. So yes, it's locally linear at x is equal to zero. All right, so last example here, and this is kind of a crazy looking uh, cubing function. Let's look at are we locally linear at x is equal to 1? Well, initially on this curve, I would say, yes, this curve looks good. Looks like a line straight through that x equals 1. Let's further investigation. Let's zoom in at that point, and let's confirm our suspicion. Well, as I start to zoom in, I see that graph really do something funky there. 
And at that point, the farther I zoom in, I am not going to see this curve pass straight through that point like a line. It kind of touches and comes back. It's real rigid there. And so we're going to say, no, this is not locally linear. at x is equal to 1. And so what this does is it brings us up to kind of an important um, I concept here when it comes to functions and um, being locally linear is that if a function is locally linear at a point, we can determine what the value would be for the instantaneous rate of change of the function is at that point. Because we saw when you zoomed in on the one graph that was locally linear, it made a straight line that passed through the function, which means that I could work and kind of, if I needed to, to use that process that we did for the thrown ball example to determine what the uh, average rate, or what the instantaneous rate of change was. And these functions that are differentiable, or the functions that are locally linear, are considered to be differentiable, meaning I can find their instantaneous rate of change at that point. The ones that are not locally linear, I could not determine the instantaneous rate of change at that point. The issue is that we have right now what our understanding is we can look at a graph and tell. However, we can never be sure that we actually zoomed in enough graphically to determine whether or not a function is differentiable. Because how, do, how far do we know to zoom in to, to say if the function is locally linear? So we're going to have to work as we progress through this chapter to find ways to determine if a function is differentiable or not without having to use a graph to determine if it's locally linear.